Welcome, everyone. Um, we're very pleased to introduce this morning's talk, Jim Heckman. It's uh, cliche to say people don't need no introduction, but uh, it's clearly the case. Uh, Jim is a Nobel laureate in economics. He won the Pro Nobel Prize in 2000. He's been an economist at the University of Chicago since 1973 and is um, a USC presidential scholar in residence. Um, Jim ha has uh, had an extremely long and distinguished career with many major and seminal contributions to econometrics. And more recently, he's taken up uh, very important uh, topics in education um, and health. Uh, with so many distinguished achievements, I think I also will mention the least distinguished thing Jim has done, which is he taught me econometrics, which I barely passed, and uh, <laughs> therefore will uh, have to struggle to uh, keep up. But we're very uh, pleased to have Jim uh, speak to us today. So I'm going to give you a talk. You can see that I didn't prepare it for USC. I'm giving it next week at. Uh, at Brookings. Um, but I've been engaged in a series of projects uh, which are involved in measuring skills and trying to understand what are effective interventions in fostering and measuring skills. And that includes early childhood programs. Uh, but there's a very important question which I think links to the interest that people have here on measurement, of trying to measure what those skills are and exactly what the frameworks are. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. So, and it's with, by the way, a graduate from the University of Chicago, a more recent graduate than Darius, uh, Tim Kautz, who's actually a first-rate scholar. And uh, he and I produced, with some others, a paper uh, issued by OECD last December uh, with a title somewhat similar to this. And the paper has had an effect in the sense that OECD, which has typically been pushing the PISA scores and PISA testing, has now incorporated this uh, study of non-cognitive and social and emotional skills into the inventories they're trying now to measure across countries. And just to, to advertise something, I was at a conference just a few weeks ago at the Spencer Foundation, and OECD is planning a study uh, which will be a 20-year long study in eight cities around the world trying to measure human development starting from at least the beginning of uh, kindergarten, and, and I think the, the hope is to push it back but looking at the interaction of the family, the school, the community, and in uh, shaping life cycle skills and, and looking peop following people at least into uh, adulthood, or at least early adulthood. And so I'm, this conference in, uh, in Brookings is really a follow-up to what we had at Spencer, and it's an attempt to, uh, and it's, it's quite interesting because the OECD really has a period. They're going to issue an RFP. Sometime you probably might be interested in betting on it. I'm not sure. But it's a massive study. Eight, they're planning on thousands of observations in eight cities around the world, including Canada. I don't think there's an American city yet involved. But there are cities like in Canada, in, in China, and several in Europe, and one or so in Africa. Uh, and it's, it's very much in planning. But the interesting part is that the next three years will be devoted to the design of the study. Instead of implementing immediately, they're going to look at aspects of measurement, surveying the literature, and proceeding in a somewhat cautious way. Although they are going to uh, issue a contract, I guess, uh, for uh, the study sometime this fall, after we have a conference. So I am planning with Kautz and others to run, and sponsored by the Spencer Foundation, we're planning a conference uh, in October, which is exactly on how to achieve the title here. So what the best thinking is. And I'll show you what I mean by what I think the best thinking is. Because this is an area that's very much involving in terms of understanding how to extract the measurements, how to control for various other distortions and measurements, framing questions, as well as questions having to do with, uh, with incentives of students on particular types of tests. So this would be both cognitive and non-cognitive tests. So anyway, that's a background. So let me just talk about uh, the, uh, an overview of what's going on. Uh, which I just gave you. And that is that there is a large audience, a large interest, I should say, in trying to uh, build together uh, inventories that are really comprehensive in terms of the skills and capabilities of individuals. And non-cognitive or so-called social and emotional skills, personality traits, which have re recently come into the forefront, are now very much on the agenda. But there's an issue about how you go about measuring it. And these character skills, it's a term that I'm going to use today. It sounds old-fashioned, very dated, you know, character, very Victorian. Uh, 
But I think the term is used. David Brooks has a recent uh, book out. I think it's called Creating Character or something like that. Uh, but, but basically, these character skills or personality skills are really quite important. So let me just give you an example, going back in American educational history to what many people consider the founder of the common school movement. This is Horace Mann. This is a, this is a, uh, uh, a quote that he made uh, or something he wrote in 1838. Uh, and of course, he's famous for his writing on education. But what he was really talking about was that we really, when we even think about schooling as a narrow enterprise, it's only a small part of schooling that actually is captured by how well students learn arithmetic, grammar, and rudiments. So uh, if you think about No Child Left Behind and the emphasis of PISA scores, we can see that we test these very rudiments that he's talking about. But the other aspects of feeling and thinking, what I'm calling character skills, was, were complete, have been ignored. And in fact, I have a book that I published last year with Kautz and John Eric Humphreys on the GED, but we review the entire history of uh, testing in the United States. And it's true that in the last 20 or 30 years, the notions of assessment of education have become narrower and narrower. And uh, we're trying to reverse that and showing exactly why it's important to do it. So I'll show you some evidence on that. And so this is the paper we talked about. This is actually with uh, uh, myself and uh, Tim Kautz and then some, uh, uh, and Lex Borgens, with whom I've written done previous work, and a student of Borgens and uh, Bastar Vale. Bastar Vale is at the Central Planning Bureau, I think, in Netherlands still. So this OECD paper is out, and you can download it uh, at no cost. And this has kind of been the center of this activity. So I'm going to talk about this and some of the other activity. But let me just talk about the history of testing. Um, I mean, testing has, uh, was viewed as a major development in the, uh, uh, in the 19th century, there really wasn't any good way to put a test in place. There wasn't any good way to imagine how you would uh, really evaluate schools. And so uh, it wasn't until about the time the IQ test got introduced in the United States, which was around 1950, the stanford Binet test, or uh, by, by Terman, actually, the Stanford psychologist, that uh, there was any kind of even widespread testing and there were just technological limitations for testing. And testing initially was focused on IQ. But then by the 1930s, uh, actually, development that was at the University of Chicago, at Ohio State University, and the University of Iowa, uh, there was an attempt to try to uh, not measure just IQ as a trait, but measure what was called general knowledge, really what schools were teaching. So, and the reason for that was a lot of different curricula were being implemented in schools. And in particular, the curricula were things, for example, that had to do with uh, uh, what so-called progressive schools in the 1930s. And they didn't follow a set curriculum. And what the Rockefeller Foundation and many foundations wanted to do was ask, are these uh, traits, uh, are, can we actually measure value added by education? Which is, of course, a huge question now. And so the, the, what we think of now is the modern achievement test got going. But the fact of the matter is, is not only to get going, but by the 1950s, when the first kind of computer, computerization, this initially just holler at card readers were introduced, people were actually able then to grade very efficiently certain kinds of tests. And that started changing the nature. The technology really drove the nature of the test that was actually being uh, given. And I'll, I'll give you a quote. I'm not 100% sure. So the concept that they tried to get at, and they being Ralph Tyler and another guy named Lindquist, who was at the University of Iowa, uh, was really general knowledge as opposed to IQ. So IQ was this capacity to solve problems quickly, but allegedly in an abstract way, independent of any context. General knowledge was acquired knowledge that allowed people to function. But this was all left to the psychometricians of the day. I mean, this kind of developed uh, psychometrics. But Tyler, who actually, he was dean of the social sciences at the University of Chicago, uh, dean of the, meta, uh, the, uh, of the education school, and so forth. Even in 1940, this is way back when, in some sense, even in 1940, Tyler was very cautious about these exams. And you can see what he's doing. And I, that's why I'm going to come back to this Tyler quotation. Because the modern notion, I think the approach that we're trying to develop now in making inventories of these skills, uh, 
is to actually think more broadly about other appraisal devices. So he's talking in 1940. And remember, this is the, really, the SAT was starting to be used. Initially, it was thought to be an IQ type test. It gradually got broadened, I think, from the scholastic aptitude test to the scholastic achievement test, and then basically just the SAT. As people began to realize, you weren't really measuring a fixed trait. You were measuring some acquired knowledge. But even then, when, so when this was, movement was just getting going, Tyler suggested a lot of other ways to look at inventories of students. And they're online inventories. They're line, there are games that people can play. And I want to talk briefly about that, those as potential mechanisms to getting a much better understanding of what the skills are of individuals. But Tyler is suggesting, for example, that there are many other appraisal devices that can be used, uh, records. Uh, remember, this is before any kind of digital computers were available. But there really were sources of data that were out there. And he felt he had a much more comprehensive notion of these skills. You could actually develop a fuller inventory of what students were learning, what their capabilities were, and how you might target improving their skills. Uh, I want to come back to this because this is where I think the modern movement is going. But it has a very clear precedent in Tyler's work. So, but the real question about the tests that we've had, and we raised this in a series of papers, is what exactly do these tests measure? And how do you validate these tests? And if you look at the way tests are actually constructed, there's a circular quality. People say, oh, this test is good because it predicts pretty well another test. I mean, economists and social scientists generally don't care whether or not one test calibrates with another. It's a useful benchmark, but there's actually much more that we're interested in. And so I'll just give you an example. This is one of many examples that we have. Uh, but this is actually saying, well, we think that what we'd really like to do is ask how well do these tests predict things that we're interested in, in the labor market, for example. And I'll show you some examples in health. So for example, uh, many people are surprised by how low the uh, predictability is of IQ for things like earnings and hourly wage rates. You can see the bar here, the dark blue bar is giving you the percent of variance explained just by IQ by itself. AFQT, which is a measure, I would claim, of an achievement test that came out of Tyler's work and so forth, has much greater predictability. But it's still the case that you're only explaining about 15% of the variance. And if you look at measurement error as an explanatory factor, it can only be at most 20, 25% for earnings. There's a lot that's unexplained. And what turns out to be interesting and a persistent finding, one that the psychologists have worked on, we've worked on, we had some studies in the Dutch schools, I'll show you in a minute, that actually then uh, shows that grade point average is actually more predictive than something like IQ or uh, certainly the AFQT. And the reason is, and I'll just to spoil my story or get, get to the point, is that the grade point average is quite uh, heavily dominated, not just by raw intelligence, but also by motivation, by the desire to learn, by achievement. So things that are typically viewed as non-cognitive skills. So in fact, in many of the recent inventories, grade point is actually being used as an assessment, as a measure. Once you standardize, adjust for IQ, grade point is a measure of non-cognitive skills. So that, so, and you can see you get a similar pattern. Uh, there's a, a similar pattern for women, but uh, instead of going over everything, uh, let me just uh, talk very briefly. So character skills are, I would claim, a missing ingredient that we're only beginning to really discover. Even though I would point out that Tyler being very consistent over time. In the 1960s, there's something called the National Association, National, uh, there's an NAEP, the Educational Assessment, which is still widely used to track the, the progress of uh, American students. Uh, initially, Tyler suggested that we, that we as a society use much broader inventory than just the test. Just the test, the easily graded multiple choice test, which became really the meaning of testing in, in modern America. And, uh, but it turned out, for technological reasons, nobody could really implement it. So it always became more costly to think about using teacher ratings. People felt teacher ratings were themselves very biased. That's why people were pushing against grade point average. Uh, it turns out, as a fact, that uh, SAT is less predictive of success in college than the grade point average. <laughs> I mean, that's something that uh, has been out in the educational literature in the last few years. So I would argue these character skills are really quite important. 
So what are the traditional approaches? And again, people can stop me and say, well, you know all this, or you're bored, and I have other things to talk about, but uh, this is a readily available slide, so I'll show you. So you probably all have heard of the big five traits. And these are traits that have now become, these were, set, these were settled more or less 20 years ago. When people started looking at personality uh, scores uh, back in the 1930s, literally the way people did this, the way the psychologists did this, was to actually uh, look at Webster's Dictionary and look at all of the traits, characteristics in Webster's Dictionary that describe human differences. So there are thousands and thousands of such traits. That wasn't a very wieldy, uh, it was a very unwieldy uh, kind of measurement system. And so what happened, there was a continual refinement by personality psychologists in the 1990s. And Goldberg uh, and uh, Oliver John, Goldberg at Berkeley, no, Goldberg at Oregon and Oliver John at Berkeley, but John was Goldberg's student, developed what's called the big five traits. And this has become the inventory. Some people call this the longitude and latitude of personality studies. Okay, and each of these traits has a facet, sub-facets, but I won't go through that. But the acronym that characterizes or one acronym is OCEAN. So it's for openness uh, to experience, so it's a tendency to be open to new aesthetic experience. Conscientiousness, and various terms have been used. Grit, Teddy Roosevelt used the term, or recently Angela, Angela Duckworth used the term. It's, it's something we all intuitively understand. Extroversion is the capacity to, you know, engage the outer world. Um, agreeableness is getting along with people. And neuroticism involves basically a kind of obsessive quality. Uh, and uh, it, it has multiple uh, uh, meanings here, but sometimes in a negative way, sometimes in a positive way. If somebody's hyperneurotic, that can be very incapacitating. None of these traits necessarily would correlate with uh, outcomes in a monotone way. You can imagine being neurotic a little bit doesn't hurt, but being hyperneurotic so you're paralyzed would be, it would be quite harmful. So there is some intrinsic nonlinearity. And that's true even for conscientiousness. We've all known people so conscientious they can't really finish anything because they really have to make it perfect. So, but these are the traits that people have used. And what's happening now, precisely because it's been measured for the last 20 years, and because there's a fairly active literature People are really quite enthusiastic about the big five traits. And so like all these measurement systems, there's been some thinking where now we say, when we think about personality, we think about the big five. And I think that's a mistake because these are traits that were elicited primarily by a factor analysis on a bunch of personality self-reports, actually. These are actually for adults and weren't validated in any substantial way until fairly recently. And they actually have a fairly limited uh, predictability. So let me, let me just show you uh, an example. See, I actually, these are very truncated slides. So I'm actually, this is a 20 minute talk that I'm stretching out uh, like an accordion here. So, <laughs> so uh, but I, I, I can talk further if you want. And actually I have very detailed notes, but you don't want to see that either. So I'll, <laughs> I, I will do the short version and then if there's longer, I can actually go to a longer version. But if you look at these big five traits, you can actually find, people have correlated those big five traits. Let me go back here a second. So for example, if you ask, what's the better predictor of mortality? Nothing predicts mortality very well. But if you were to compare IQ, for example, versus conscientiousness, conscientiousness is much more predictive than IQ, for example, in these traits. If you were to look at things like uh, crime and participation, you know, there's a whole literature on psychology. It got very popular about certain low IQ people were likely to commit crime. But measures of conscientiousness and extroversion, sort of the, the openness, kind of the, the way that people uh, engaged in the art of society, including negative behaviors, uh, turn out to be more predictive of crime. And I'll show you a little bit of that uh, than actually the uh, structure of, uh, of, uh, of IQ and some of the conventional measures. And in fact, when you look at early childhood programs, and you start looking at what the mechanisms are that actually produce their effectiveness. Most, not all, and depending on the age at which these early childhood programs are introduced, but the, the programs that are most effective have operated, if, if you do a kind of mediation study, do a mediation study, we published one in the American Economic Review a couple of years ago, suggesting that an iconic program called Perry Preschool Program, which follows people now up to age 50, and by the way, we're gonna get the age 50 data 
or I mean, I'm now engaged with the Perry program. We did a follow-up study, and we will have very detailed health measures, and of course, all of these cognitive and non-cognitive measures as well. We're going to have that data available next month, so we will be able to have people at age 50 will be able to have full follow-ups. We have data on health, which I'll show you uh, from the ABC program, which is another early intervention. But what it turns out, and this is something that's extremely important, was that if we look at how these skills evolve, most of the early childhood programs don't boost IQ. Certainly all of the so-called pre-K programs don't. What they do, actually, is they boost these social and emotional traits. They build skills, people cooperate together. There's a tremendous amount of interaction and um, uh, uh, engagement that actually occurs, but it doesn't have lasting effects on IQ. The exception so far in, has been these programs that are targeting very early years. And those very early years would mean here, that there's a program that was done in North Carolina uh, now some 40, 45 years ago called the ABC program, ABC Darien program. Uh, and that program actually ended up boosting IQ. But it started children when they were eight weeks old. And it followed them through age five for the principal group and even some of the kids through, through age eight. And so the, and it turns out when you do an analysis and put these various studies together that almost all of the IQ boosting effects come in the first two or three years. And that actually goes back to some work which suggests that IQ is fairly stable after a certain age. In fact, all of these different traits have different kinds of stabilities and malleabilities. This is what I've worked about. I don't have good slides, so I'll just verbally explain. So we have these multiple capabilities which explain how people perform in society at large. IQ is, as I'm going to say, it's fixed. There's a genetic component, but it can be modified by uh, experience. It can also be, in fact, it turns out some of the most interesting work on inheritabilities is showing that heritability of things even like IQ is modified by experience. So you get very disadvantaged families. The heritability factor declines from like 50%, which is the norm for a lot of these social behavioral genetics studies, to 20% or lower. Uh, the caveat with that study is they're conditioning on a measure of income, and the income itself may be genetically <laughs> determined, so that the statement that experience matters has not been fully established as in a truly causal basis. But there is some thinking, certainly, that even though it's, it, even if you get to as high a level as 50%, that it's fairly stable. But, but the point is, is that, the, that the rank stability of IQ is, I mean, you can get smarter. You can acquire more knowledge. But the rank stability of who's smart and who's not smart is basically pretty well established in the late, I would say, by 8, 9, 10. For these non-cognitive skills, there's much greater malleability. And that's the, the point of economic and social policy. Uh, these are, these are, and this actually has some relationship to work in, uh, in neuroscience and to work on the, what many people, what neuroscientists uh, and some psychologists would call uh, the development of the, uh, the slow development, I guess, of the prefrontal cortex, which is basically saying that you know, we acquire a richer set of personality traits. As we mature, we gain new strategies. We become essentially more effective. And this, the rank stability of measures, uh, so not only do we get new traits, but the same stability, uh, the, the stability of traits like conscientiousness or grit or some, some of these big five traits, much less than it would be for IQ when you get into the teens and the 20s. So there is some thinking that the prefrontal cortex is still expanding. There's still a lot of work, but that's what's controlling regulation, controlling behavior. So a big part of the work that I'm doing, I have been doing in the past, has been to try to understand how, uh, what exactly, which skills can be affected at which stages of the life cycle, and then what the measurements of those skills should be. All of these are interrelated. So if that's a vague statement, then I'm happy to specify it. But there really is what we call a technology of skill formation, a capability formation that suggests that some stages are more efficacious. More investment or interaction that's producing these skills is actually far more efficacious at certain stages of the life cycle than other stages. But for non-cognitive skills, there's a lot of fluidity that's going on into the early 20s. There have even been Supreme Court cases, right, suggesting that people who are, have committed crimes in 17, 18 years of age, there's a group here at USC doing exactly uh, on this, 
uh, working on this. Uh, but basically, the, the idea being as well, because the full sense of responsibility, even the full sense of maturity and ability to, to make decisions correctly, doesn't emerge until sometime in the 20s. So I think death penalty cases have actually been settled on this kind of idea. So anyway, this whole question is how do we measure these traits and then what inventories and, and exactly how they would do. So this is why I'm so deeply interested into this. And so if you look at this measures that we have right now of character skills, they rival cognitive skills in determining life success. Let me give you an example. This is something I did with Kautz and with Humphreys. Uh, we have a book called The Myth of Achievement Tests. I think it's probably a bad name to, a uh, bad uh, strategy to call something, anything of the myth of this, that, or the other thing. But we settled on it for, for better or for worse. It's coming out in paperback too, actually. Uh, and so uh, let me give you a background on the study. I don't know how many people know the GD. Everybody know the GD? I mean, the GD program was introduced based on a test by the same Ralph Tyler that I mentioned earlier in the 1940s. It was originally, attended, uh, originally in, intended to be given to uh, Army veterans coming back from the Second World War, many of whom had dropped out of high school because they had to go and serve in the military. Uh, but they had attended military education. They had attended these so-called armed forces education tests, uh, armed forces uh, schools where they learned various things, including reading, writing, and arithmetic. Uh, and so the idea was to integrate veterans after the war back into the educational system. So the GI Bill actually uh, was implemented in part by giving the GED tests, filtering students on the basis of their uh, uh, test scores, uh, these, these uh, what would be, was what then called the Veterans Testing Service uh, scores, but taking those test scores and uh, implementing them and uh, taking them to uh, and seeing how well they should go to college or to some sort of vocational school or the like. So this test was expanded and it gradually became part of a mainstream strategy. So by the mid 1960s, even though the initial target had been veterans who had served for two or three years, maybe four years during the Second World War, then instead it became applied to try to be a remedial second chance strategy for high school dropouts. We had high school dropouts who would take an exam. They would take the exam, it was an achievement test. The achievement test is pretty well calibrated against other achievement tests. And the idea was that the uh, exam would then certify whether or not they had the effective knowledge of, of an ordinary uh, high school graduate. And so that was really the embodiment of general knowledge, the idea that you acquired a certain set of skills and the test would capture it. So let me just show you. We actually have some graphs here. And the pattern is pretty similar between males and females, so I really combine the two. It's not a big difference at all. But if you look, for example, at the high school dropouts, so this is actually a measure of uh, cognitive ability. And this shows you kind of what you would hope would happen for a good test. Namely, that the distribution of test scores of high school graduates who don't go on to college and the GED students who don't go on to college, it's kind of some benchmark group, that the distributions are more or less overlapping. That so you get a very high correlation between the GED test and other measures of achievement. So that's good. And so based on that, people said, OK, that's great. We're going to use this as a measure, OK, as a measure of what was really, whether or not students were really effective in high school and so forth. Now, if we look, for example, at the distribution of character skills, which we estimate in various ways, and I'll explain that if there's some interest, what we see is something that's quite interesting. Even though the GDs are as smart as ordinary high school graduates, okay, in terms of their non-cognitive skills, basically they are at the level of, very close to the level of, or at the level of, high school dropouts. So it's an interesting test. I mean, it's, this wasn't intended. You know, if you don't worry about these non-cognitive traits, why should you worry much? But what's interesting is that the GEDs, when they look, when they look at the labor market performance and you control for their higher level of cognitive ability, the GEDs are earning at the wage of high school dropouts. And with just about everything they participate in, they drop out of. They dropped out of school. They dropped out of the military at high rates. 
until, until the military got pressed uh, to, to bring the people to fight the wars in Afghanistan and so forth, it was the case that military would not even take honor the GED as, a, uh, as an exam. Uh, they would not even honor it. And so the idea was that precisely because the GED did serve as an indicator for with these, these, these character skills where the children were less effective. The question is, how do you measure the character skills? And I want to come back to this, but I'll tell you right now, what we're measuring this. I'm perfectly happy to give you the paper. The other, other paper, actually, I was going to give. Maybe I should switch back and forth. No? <laughs> OK. No, no, whatever. No, no, I, I'll answer. But if this is behaviors at an earlier age. And this is a whole question that I want to talk about in the rest of the. What is the measure? Was it the big five? We had some measures that proxy the big five. We have some measures about self-esteem. We have some measures that are given on the more traditional measures. But from economic perspective, what we're looking at and using as measures are behaviors. And from the point of view of pure psychology, that's somehow very alien to say somehow behaviors should be used to predict later behaviors. Now that by itself isn't controversial. But as I mentioned earlier, and I'll try to come back to again, what we have as measures, like minor misbehaviors, like at age eight, ninth grade, tenth grade, and so forth. These other measures that we had for, high, for achievement were taken into the 30s and in the 40s. So we have data from the NLSY that take you into the 1940s, in, into the age 40s. So, um, so it's, it's a measure of behavior, but it's a composite of measures. Here what I've done is I've collapsed them all into a single factor. When we do this in a more ge general way, when we've done this in some other papers, we had a paper published in the Journal of Econometrics last December, where we actually find as many as 13 dimensions for non-cognitive traits. So it's not like you can really collapse it. But here we've collapsed it into a measure of misbehaviors, minor misdemeanors, and so forth. But the fact of the matter is, when we look at big five inventories and correlate with the behavior, there's some correlation. It's not like there's no correlation at all. But it's also the case that different inventories are capturing different aspects of human behavior. And a richer study would actually put together these measures. And I'll try to come back to that. But that's an issue, and, and it's an issue of how we should measure it, and that's really what I want to talk about. Ocean, ocean taken at different stages and asking how well that inventory compares to other inventories you might take, including behaviors. See, I mean, I'll give you an example. Our, study, our analysis of the Perry Preschool program, the reason why we established that these non-cognitive traits were important, is we actually had assessments by, early, by teachers in elementary school. This is like at ages one, two, three, and four. And these were assessments by teachers of uh, the behavior of the children, the way they were carrying on. I would call that the same concept of behavior as I'm using here in the NLSY. It's behaviors as elicited by teachers. It turned out that self-reports, of course, at that stage, self-reports are meaningless. But if you talk about parental reports, parenting reports were meaningless. I mean, every parent thinks their kid is wonderful. And it didn't correlate at all with the structure of what the teachers were doing. And so on that basis, when we started asking, what were the predictabilities of going out and looking at earnings, for example, and looking at, so we had the earnings data now uh, initially to age 40, now to age 50. Uh, we found that these co non-cognitive traits that we elicited from the teachers were far more predictive of what later life behavior was than anything the parents reported or even some of the other psychological inventories that we had that were taken. The trouble is that when the Perry program was initially constructed, or conducted, I should say, there was no big five. So any of the standard inventories weren't there. So the people made up their own inventories that could be mapped somehow into the big five, and they just weren't as predictive as these earlier measures. That's, that's the point. And we know, for example, in crime, I'll give you an example, Terry Moffitt's work on crime. She's a psychologist and um, criminologist. She's found that if you want to look, make predict, predictions of adult crime, a serious adult crime, that behaviors at the ages three to four are very strongly predictive of that. It's not criminal behavior as we'd normally mean it. It's just kind of aggressive, kind of not. And it, that, the beauty of Perry was that it actually targeted kids at exactly that age, and ABC as well. So it actually had a huge effect in reducing crime. But it kind of brought in, so there was a problem there. So what I'm suggesting is that there are these elicitations. These big five traits are not completely at odds with the behavioral behavior, right? But what I'm suggesting is we can have much richer notions of inventories if we use behaviors. And so I don't want to, I know maybe Ralph Tyler doesn't carry any salience, but 
the fact that the early pioneers were thinking about uh, using exactly these inventories of just how kids were responding. Nowadays, we have much richer capacities to actually elicit these traits. And in fact, that's what I want to talk about. So the idea is early behavior, yes. But early behavior, if you really want to think about it, I hope I have a graph up here. I probably won't. I'll, I'll just say, by the way, this is, uh, this is the kind of interest in talking about GEDs versus high school graduates. You can see the GEDs are much, a lot of them attempt college. But don't forget, college in the United States is a pretty low standard. That includes community college. And includes community college for learning how to read and write. <laughs> so it's a pretty low standard. If you ask who graduates with a four-year degree, the GEDs just don't make it. And so, and I could give you a lot of other data on wages, but I've cut that out. So this is the claim, and I can show you this if you want to see it. But they're dropping out of marriage and military. This is also what I said. The other part about the GED, and I'll come back to your question because it's really the essence of what I want to talk about. The GD is also ended up corrupting social statistics. It turned out precisely because people thought that these test scores measured exactly what schools captured and what was important, that uh, when the GD filtered its way into the prison system, as it did in the 1980s, that, and during the time when a lot of blacks were being incarcerated in this you know, 1980s incarceration drug, drug boom, that turned out a lot of, uh, you could get an easier parole or release from prison if you got a GD. So there were enormous incentives to take GEDs. And so what happened is there was a huge increase in what looked like high school equivalency. And it was. And it had to do with the fact that a lot of blacks who had been high school dropouts, prison uh, high school dropouts are the ones who populate prisons by and large, except for white collar crime, uh, that uh, you, what you see is basically um, uh, a large increase in what looks like an improvement in the black high school graduation rate. But that's only if you count GEDs as high school graduates. If you take that out, the high school graduation rate did not improve. Murnane has a recent paper claiming that it has improved since 2008. I'm not 100% sure about it. But certainly, up through 2008, the high school dropout rate for males was actually declining if you got rid of the GED. So that's the sense of corruption. And it literally, when you induce it into high schools, the GED causes people to, there's a program it was available in Oregon for a while, where people could take the GD, they would drop out um, of school, get the GD. My, in my own case, when I first heard about the GD, my kids were both very young, and I explained to them, you could take this GD test, and, if you, and you could basically satisfy high school uh, uh, equivalents. You wouldn't have to go to high school. So I brought a copy of a test exam, and they both said, you know, I think, I don't know, what, one was in high school and the other was in junior high school. So, well, gee, we might as well just do this. They were in lab school at the University of Chicago, and they said, why don't we take the GD? The point is a lot of kids actually do that. Of course, they didn't in that case, but, but the fact of the matter is, is that it really was a case where the testing mania got taken, kind of went out of control. So what I want to consider is this question about new approaches. I'm going to come back exactly to this, to measuring character, cognitive skills beyond the big five. And this is the key, this is what I really want to talk about. And this, I think, captures a lot of questions in psychology and measurement, which is what we're in the middle of. This is a very simple diagram, um, deliberately so. But if we think about all tests, everything, all inventories are measures of how people do on a particular performance. An IQ test is just another task, right? It's a task of sort of answering a raven's matrix, filling it out in certain ways. Um, an achievement test is actually doing the same thing. Task performance could be how well you sit in school, how well you sit down, uh, and whether you're stable, uh, have stable personalities. But this creates a challenge and I think a promise as well. But what we can see is that, and this is where I think it's really important to kind of not kind of fixate on something. See, I, I've been around long enough to have a certain mistrust. I mean, there's great advantage to actually having a division of knowledge today. I have these experts over here. I take their wisdom and I implement it in my study. And I've done that before. That's how I was using the big five and using a lot of the previous inventories. But then I sort of question, well, wait a minute. These things were arrived at through some kind of factor analysis. There wasn't that much validation. And there were a lot of other traits that potentially came available. For the economists in the room, for example, uh, you, did, you notice, in fact, the big five did not include things like risk aversion, ambiguity aversion, time preference, 
and so forth. And so Duckworth and I, uh, with Borgens, actually sat down uh, and I spent like six months, uh, about seven or, seven or eight years ago, thinking all I'm going to do is map all of the standard traits that economists have found to be important into big five measures. So we had this table, this had this, we're going to fill it out, which was which, how did they map? And uh, what we ended up with was an understanding that we couldn't do that. That there really were aspects of the big five that weren't fully captured by the standard traits of uh, economics and things like trust and empathy and so forth. And that economics really did have some added uh, dimensions of human performance. And then afterward in that paper, uh, Armin Falk and Dolman, Thomas Dolman, conducted a series of papers. Falk has access to the German socioeconomic panel. And so in response to that paper, we talked a lot about it, uh, he actually put big five questionnaires on the German socioeconomic panel. And what he was able to do then was actually measure things like time preference, risk aversion. He was doing that anyway as part of the German socioeconomic panel. And then he could calibrate how highly correlated these traits were. And the fact is they were very poorly correlated. There did seem to be a bigger span of human dimension, of human productivity. And um, so that's, that's kind of uh, the background of where this diagram, or well, this diagram was like in the earlier paper. But the point is, is that this, this is kind of obvious in some sense, but it's really important. So for example, take IQ test. Suppose the task is IQ, and we look at effort. So one thing that we found, and I don't know if you know about these incentivized tests that were given to low-income children. You know, there's a lot of concern about the black-white difference in the United States. And the, at, at, at the time these, con these uh, tests were conducted, the average IQ for the black in the U.S. population was one standard deviation lower than that of the white. Well, it turned out then some tests, some, some experiments were conducted. Children, all African-American, in poverty neighborhoods were given the IQ test under two different conditions. One was for each correct answer, they got an M&M. &M. For the other, it was a standard incentive. And then it turned out that, uh, <laughs> that the black-white test score gap more or less vanished on that particular administration of the IQ test. That it really was the effort. The incentives of individuals in that situation were very much weaker. And now this is refined. Borgens has a very interesting series of papers where he also says, now, suppose that I give something like the M&M &M tests, but I measure something like conscientiousness. And if you look at conscientiousness, what you find is that the elasticity of response, say, to, to an M&M, &M is completely contingent on how conscientious and how motivated the students are. The motivated students weren't at all incentivized by the M&Ms, the highly conscientious students. But the ones who were less conscientious and less motivated in that sense were highly responsive. And so there's a, there is an interaction. And that's all I'm really saying, is that any task performance is going to depend on both cognitive skill, say in this case the IQ test, as well as the non-cognitive traits of how motivated I, I am, and also the health. I mean, we know that children who are actually ill, uh, children, uh, 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 we know, uh, for example, from John Curry's work and other work, that children who are suffering asthma and so forth do much worse on these tests. I mean, they, obviously, they're physically impaired, and that affects their... But this creates a huge issue. And this is an issue that actually characterized a lot of work in psychology. So I don't know how many people have heard about Walter Mischel. We've all heard of Walter Mischel. But you know about the controversy about, he wrote a book in 1967. And what he said was that there was no such thing as a stable personality trait, none. He was a social psychologist fully at that time. And his idea was everything was affected by the situation. And so in terms of this diagram, Mischel would basically say it's all in the first the first uh, line here, this box, incentives to effort to task performance, was the whole story, and that there were no stable traits, except maybe IQ. Now, the irony in that, of course, is that he's the guy who also did the marshmallow experiment, which everybody's heard about, which showed that, you know, 20 years later, the kids who could wait for a marshmallow were far more successful. If they, waiting for a second marshmallow showed a little more uh, 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 reduced time preference, were actually highly successful. But that's getting ahead of the story. And still, in a lot of work in behavioral economics, there are people who will claim, Thaler, my colleague, actually, has basically kind of echoed what uh, is going on. That's not a universal statement of behavioral economics. But in some quarters, the view is really these character skills, it's all situational. In fact, it's a raging debate, which I know 
many of you have participated in. You think about health behaviors and so forth. You say, well, we changed the situation. And what I think is, is, is true, it, it sounds very mediocre to say this, is you know, both stories are correct, but I do think that these traits do matter and that they can be shaped as a matter of intervention. But I think the challenge here is to understand if I have a particular task, how do I allocate the performance of that task unless I have some kind of variation in the effort, the incentives that I give people, and some ways to think about measuring character skills and cognitive skills and some of the background traits. So then the whole question becomes the measurement issue has to really be think, thought of more broadly. And if we can vary the incentives of individuals and in experiments, come up with benchmarks of these different traits, it's, it's kind of circular. In some sense, if I just state the problem this way, it's hopeless. Because if every task depends on every trait and, and some effort, which I can't measure, then it's a hopeless mess. But it's not quite so hopeless, I think. In the end, we end up, like in factor analysis, making a normalization. We say, OK, we think of IQ. As a pure measure of IQ, we say, how well can I basically you know, extract um, uh, you know, how well do I do on an abstract test, like a Raven's matrix? We can control for things like incentives. And we actually have some studies now that we're doing in Buenos Aires in public schools. It's harder to do this in American schools, but I think we're going to probably do this in the Chicago public schools in, in the future. We have some, some interest in that. But what we do is we can vary the incentives and the rewards for people to perform different tasks. And we can also look at measures of, uh, we, and, and, and so we can then see Across tasks, some tasks are more heavily dependent on things like uh, IQ than other tasks. So an extreme example would be if you're working on Fermat's last theorem, probably what you need is two things. You need to be pretty smart. I think, I think if somebody's IQ of 20 is probably not going to solve it, or did, wouldn't have solved it. And there's some aspect of character skills, because this guy, Wiles, shut himself up in his attic for t 10 years and so forth. But my guess is he wasn't that extroverted and so forth. So we go through a series of tasks. We vary the set of tasks. And we can kind of go back and understand to what extent then can we see how, as we go across tasks, different factors. I'll use the term factors, but it doesn't have to be literally a factor. And we've moved long beyond linear factor analysis to nonlinear factor models and nonparametric models, as a matter of fact. But, 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 but think, think of factor analysis, simple factor analysis. We can ask how these different tasks, how these, how these different factors load onto different tasks and under different incentivized conditions. So that's, uh, that's the challenge. So let me go forward. How am I doing? I'm running out of time. OK. Um, so really, the distinction that I really want to make here is that even though we take as given the idea that psychologists have done their job, I'm not attacking psychologists. But what I'm suggesting is we can supplement the activity of psychologists. Uh, so even though Duckworth was a co-author on the paper that has this, she's never implemented any of this. And I think it's true of a lot of psychologists that they literally are thinking about they have these measures which they take. They give you a survey, and that survey is independent of some task where I can assess the individual. And I think those tasks are actually equally valid, maybe more valid measures. One, what was one thing that Perry Preschool did? It took these kids, all of them were disadvantaged children, from basically a city just west of Detroit and um, uh, Ypsilanti, Michigan. And they basically um, took these kids, and the kids who were put in the treatment group and then followed for now 50 years were basically came in every day, and they were assigned a project. And they were said, OK, here's the project. Pick a task, do the task, and review the task. That involved collective activity in reviewing the task. It involved staying on course. It involved also the judgment of what your task is going to be. It would be things that you know, would consist of things, for example, like looking at the structure of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, like making a toy or building a, you know, maybe they really couldn't write that well, but the, you know, doing very simple tasks. But then when you look at the measures in terms of the outcomes of these kids and the, the measures that we have crude for sure, but looking at behaviors and so forth you see lasting effects on their behavior and no effect on their IQ. I mean, I don't have the graph here, but if you look at the IQ of, of the Perry treatment kids, they, uh, by age 10, the IQ of the treatment and control groups basically identical. For the ABC program, it started earlier. Perry starts at 3. There is a difference in IQ that lasts. 
So there's no difference in IQ, but these other traits carried on. So, and I would argue that we did boost those. And I would argue we have evidence, for example, of mentoring programs in high school, mentoring programs in the workplace. This OECD study actually has a lot of, it reviews hundreds of these papers. Uh, I'll show you a grid, but I don't think you wanted me to go through every one of these. But over the whole life cycle. So it starts early, but includes middle school, high school interventions. Tim Couch is involved in a study at the, the Chicago Public Schools. He just finished the study for his thesis at Chicago. But what he does, what he does is uh, this program is called uh, One Goal. It's written up in a, under a different name by uh, Paul Tuff in a book called What Makes Children Succeed. It was a, a bestseller a few years ago. Tuff visited the group and, uh, and, and kind of codified what we were talking about. But, but what was interesting uh, was that this program is taking kids who are kind of average in inner city high schools, average, not the worst, not the best, and basically gave them uh, mentoring. So it provided them advice, guidance, and they stay with it. I mean, a lot of these programs that have sort of placed kids into high school, uh, into college, get them there, and they don't follow them. This program mentored the children. I would argue that was building a form of kind of continued conscientiousness and so forth. But see, this is where, I, to boil down what I think the essence of this is, all of these, all education, I mean, we think of education like what's going on right now. Somebody stands in front of the room, everybody, people sit passively or not so passively uh, and listen to what the, the great person is saying. Okay. But actually, all education involves interaction. Everything we learn involves interaction. The child development psychologists call it scaffolding. And which has a very nice image where you're staying with the kid, kind of like building a sculpture, taking what's the next step. I'm going you know, to build a, the head now. I'm going to put a, you know, the, the torch or the Statue of Liberty or whatever. I'm going to carefully assemble this. And, but what it really is is staying with the child and interacting with the child. And so the nature of education involves interaction. And that's what we're modeling now. That's actually the, what I think is, and it's missing. So even in some of my earlier work, stuff that I published a few years ago, we thought of this as more like an investment framework. Here's this passive little child, and we're dumping goods and various things into the child. And what I'm suggesting now is a much more dynamic, interactive model. So we're modeling this as a strategic interaction between parent and child, and actually between parent, child, and teacher. So it's a three-way interaction with the community being there in the board. But that changes the nature of how you define these traits. So I go back to this diagram. Now I really am talking. We have some working papers. I don't have them right here circulate, but the point is, is that we think of these traits not as just some invariant genetically endowed something, but something that emerges from this process of interaction. And then the whole dynamics of skill formation comes from that interaction. And that's what we're doing. But that interaction is clearly affected by incentives in the system and also by the children. So literally, the individualized, tailored instruction for the individual, a good teacher will actually recognize. Here's a child who's not motivated. I'll teach that child something different. And so that's where the program, a corrective notion, would be to say, this child is low in non-cognitive skills. We went to a preschool in Kentucky. I went to a preschool in Kentucky a couple of years ago. It was very interesting. Uh, they kept logs every week of full inventories. Everything here, non-cognitive skills, their, their interpretation of these skills. Each week, the teachers would sit down and say, OK, here's our kid. Our kid is really having a little trouble with this kind of cognitive function. We you should spend some more time reading. They'd spend a little more time uh, with the kid. Um, uh, they say, oh, kid's having behavior problems, or this kid is really superior. And they would literally change the curriculum week by week. And they would track the progress. So this is almost like this is scaffolding in the ultimate sense of the term. And of course, they had read the child development literature and knew it. But literally, it's almost like, uh, you know, to use an old example from the uh, you know, the military, it's, it's really almost like uh, a, a missile system, right? Trying to track. It's not trying to destroy a plane. It's really staying with the kid, boosting the kid, and then really understanding. So it's the interactive process which is missing from this. But the traits emerge from that interactive process. And so we think about these traits as something given, but they come out of this interaction. And it's a form of learning by doing, but in an interactive strategy. That's the that's the, that's the economic model. It's under preparation. Uh, so this is what, by the way, these are the examples I was talking about in terms of IQ and incentives. These are the tests here. Uh, some of these go back to 43 years. 
and we got uh, you know some real substantial improvement uh, in these tests. I overdid it here with these tests. But this is the Dutch study that I did uh, with Borgens, actually. Uh, Borgens and I and John Eric Humphreys. And we look at the conventional measures of, of grades. And we took what, again, see, there's a circular quality here in what I'm saying. Somehow you have to take a position. Well, how do you measure IQ? So I'm going to use Ravens as a measure of IQ. It's not a fully incentivized controlled Ravens, but these are middle class kids in a Dutch high school. Uh, it's called Stella Maris. Maybe you know it. It's in Maastricht. You know it? Okay, apparently there's a chain of these schools. You know Maastricht, but not Stella Maris. Anyway, the point is, is that what, so what you can see is if you look at what the major determinant of grades are. So we had measures of things like the big five. Uh, we have IQ. It's a Raven's IQ. And uh, we can actually see that uh, if you put everything together, there's still a lot unexplained, OK? So if you want to explain grades, IQ is explaining very little of grades, right? Like 1% of the grades uh, uh, in this particular school. Uh, now we've standardized, I think, for incentives, because most of these kids are pretty highly incentivized. The big five, such as it is, in grit, we added Angela Duckworth's measure to it, explains mostly all of grades. That's why, in this, to come back to your question, what we were using in some of those measures to come up with those test scores, we were using grades normalized by IQ as a measure of achievement. And it was a measure of motivation based on studies like this. So there's a series. I mean, I'm not saying this is the final word, but it's, it's underway. You can also see, for example, that IQ, um, big five and grit together explain a lot. Uh, IQ explains some of achievement, uh, big five and grit, <coughs> others as well. So this is where this process is an evolution. Um, so I've already told you about this. So here, let me just, I guess I'm close to the end. OK, fine. You can show me. So I would, th this is what I'm saying, though. That right now, if, psych if economists take the psychologists, at least the personality, throw the psychology is a huge field. And so when I talk about the psychologists, I'm talking about the personality psychologists. They're cognitive psychologists who would reject everything, and social psychologists who would reject. So, so the, just like in economics, there are different groups that, you know, I wouldn't say dislike each other, but don't trust each other. <laughs> they just think that it's all nonsense what the other groups are doing. But I think economists have, have really spent a lot of time thinking about these things. And we do have elicitations. We have mechanisms for doing so. We offer people experiments. We put people in experiments. We have ways to do this. And we do know that these things are somewhat predictive. If you look at some of Falk's work based on the GSOP, the German Socioeconomic Panel, you'll see the risk aversion, trust, and empathy, uh, uh, ambiguity aversion, and time preference are all factors that matter. And what I would have shown you had I given the other talk was that education can actually foster each of those traits as well. So we can actually, if you believe that I've given you a causal account of that, we can actually find that education and interaction more broadly can do so. So here I'm repeating Tyler. I won't do that again. But basically, here's where I'm being faithful. There's a, there's a psychologist I work with. He's University of Illinois. Uh, Roberts is his name. And he is an extremely uh, thoughtful guy. And even though the psychologist, at least the personality psychologist I work with, have not been that quantitative, if you look at his definition, you can see that what he's talking about is enduring patterns of thought. I would say, I rephrase it in the terms of economics, that these are strategies that people use. And they use it to adapt to a given situation. So we want to think of personality as being a set of strategies that people use. And they actually can be acquired through a form of habit formation. So here's, oh, here's what I actually, uh, so let me show you. Uh, this is something from Kautz and Zanoni's study in the uh, Chicago public schools. So if you ask who graduates secondary school, and you ask, well, you has, he has measures of IQ. He has measured the achievement test. And he has the ninth grade GPA and ninth grade absences. So from school system records, you can actually look. And these are the teacher's accounts that many people minimize as being biased and so forth. But these aren't biased in the following sense. Grade points may be affected by one teacher. So you get rid of, they take medians of these distributions. Um, but grade point average is far more predictive of who's graduating. And if you add grade point to ninth grade, many of the standard measures are not all that predictive. What we're planning to do is then look at some of these behaviors that are available from the school system record. 
interpret those as traits and then give the Chicago public school children uh, the big five as well. So we can actually do a cross calibration. We haven't done that. So this is important. The other part of the Kautz and Zanoni study is that they actually show that certain aspects of cognition, this mentoring that the One Goal program actually gives these children, actually improves tremendously. High school graduation, college attendance, and remaining in college. So it's changing the, I say, it's changing the traits. And they're available from public school records. So, uh, and so actually, this is from the paper I didn't give you. Uh, but it's kind of the companion piece of this GD study, but it's a more recent version, that you do find sorting. That if you look at measures of cognition, uh, you know, achievement tests that are somehow standardized for some of these non-cognitive factors, you get a sorting of the kind you might expect. Uh, that namely more smarter kids are the ones who graduate from college and so forth. Uh, but if you look at the social and emotional factors extracted from these behaviors, and try with a lot of different systems, self-report systems, now for high school students, as well as behaviors, you get very strong sorting. So, so I think, uh, and then these are the, this is what I was, uh, so in, in talking about the causal analysis, this is actually from the other paper, you can actually see that if you take these measures of cognitive and non-cognitive behavior that we have in the National Longitudinal Survey, and you go from the bottom decile to the top, the, the top curve is the joint distribution, you can see that both cognitive and non-cognitive traits are important in predicting who graduates high school. And we have a lot of other behaviors, getting a GED, uh, graduating high school, and so forth. And so, uh, you know, these things can be uh, fostered. And here's the GED, here's the Perry study. So Perry has a 7 to 10% rate of return, cost-benefit analysis. We still haven't measured the full health impact. We will have that. We have actually physicians' visits now. And as I should say, we'll have that data available early next month. But you can see the Perry had no effect whatsoever uh, in terms of IQ in the long term. It's the same for males and females. So I, I say that. Yet you get like 6 to 10% per annum. And that's adjusting for deadweight cost of taxation. It's adjusting for uh, a range of uh, behaviors. And it really is through the non-cognitive traits. And I work through non-cognitive and character skills. So here's, here's, my, here's my example. But again, you see, all of these are kind of put together. So uh, let me see. I mean, just looking at my slide, this, this is actually a mediation analysis and decomposing the traits. But since I know there's a lot of interest in health here, I will put up here something that we're actively working on with your group. This is a paper that was published in Science last year. Now this, remember, the interesting thing about these early childhood programs, both Perry and ABC, is when they were conducted, when they were initially proposed, the whole idea was to boost IQ of disadvantaged children. Because that was the reigning theory, that IQ and cognition was what was dominant in what could create success in life. As a byproduct, it turned out, we looked at other measures. And so, for example, um, in this case, medical records were actually achieved. These were physicians' visits by the ABC group, the treatment and control group. These people are now 35 years of age. You can see substantial differences, for example, in blood pressure, hypertension, uh, HDL, uh, cholesterol, uh, obesity measures, and so forth. And so uh, and we're, we're, we're translating that into a cost-benefit study here, working with you guys. But uh, one of the main mechanisms is through promoting these so-called non-cognitive skills. So you think of health. How do you promote health? Well, obviously one way is you give people doctors and gain access to medications. That's the traditional view. But the perspective that we have is you're building these social and emotional skills. Those turn out to be very important. And again, we haven't finished the full mediation analysis yet for the ABC study. You have a group working on it in Chicago. But it's showing that, uh, again, the mechanism was. And this came as a great surprise. So in 1960s, when cognitive psychology ruled the roost and changed educational policy, thought it was all about IQ. And suddenly, we're realizing we've boosted a whole set of behaviors, including the fact of how people are taking care of themselves and what their adult health is and how that, how that uh, emerges over the life cycle. So uh, anyway, uh, this is the, i just repeating what I said earlier. Gaps in non-cognitive skills emerge early. They're tied to family background and measures of disadvantage. Uh, disadvantage, by the way, I don't think is measured by income. I mean, people use that. It's common. Disadvantage has much more to do with parenting style and those kinds of resources. Non-cognitive skills are highly malleable. 
and there are a lot of programs. And uh, I, you know, I could go on. I, I, I actually this. I will say this: if you go to the OECD study, which I mentioned, we go through a whole series of programs. So these are all randomized controlled trials, or largely randomized controlled trials. And what we do is we go through. This is a very busy grid. I don't know if you can even see it. But we look at the uh, group, starting from the early childhood programs through elementary school, adolescence, and so forth. We look at a variety of programs with various follow-ups, looking at what the effects were on adult outcomes, almost adult outcomes, and what, what cost-benefit ratios are. And it, so I don't want to suggest it's all just early childhood programs. Some of the adolescent interventions are really quite successful. And they actually are operating, again, through this kind of mentoring which is boosting these kinds, I would call, social and emotional skills. So you can look at that paper if you really are interested in this. We've written, it's quite extensive. And in fact, that paper then takes you to an even bigger appendix, which is like 200 pages online, with the detailed discussion of each of the programs. So you don't have to trust anything I'm saying. Um, you can say that. But, but you know, so we can go on about this, and I, I'll stop. I mean, it's just going through this here. We're going through lots of studies just to show you all that you're missing. Um, <laughs> But uh, no, no, but, but the point is, is that we can actually evaluate. Look, for example, this is a program that was done in uh, Seattle. And the kids were followed through 18 years, uh, through 25 years, actually. This is the age 18 score. And what it was was basically boosting social and emotional skills. It was targeted that direction. And you get some significant improvements. These are experimentally determined treatment effects on the grade point average, less on the achievement test, but some. In Perry, in Perry if I can find it quickly, uh, what you also found was that you did improve achieve achievement tests, but you d achieved it not because they were any smarter, because the kids were more motivated they didn't learn from school. We think it will have a big effect on health. We don't know that for, for, for a fact. The one goal program is basically Tim's program, and, uh, and so I, I think I should stop. Here's the summary. So I'll stop with the summary. So anyway, we're in the middle of this process. What I didn't talk about was there are a lot of very exciting ways to elicit these preferences and these traits, not just in through standard tests, not just through these behaviors. So behaviors, and then elicited through some online games, and then through using uh, richer inventories of student behavior, I think will come together to create a much better understanding of what the human traits are that matter, and a deeper understanding of the evaluation. And uh, what's come onto the forefront, though, is soft skills, and the fact that soft skills, or so-called soft skills, social and emotional skills, which were completely considered, you know, too fuzzy, very, very, and it is. I mean, you look at it, you go to governors and you go to public officials, everybody, the term soft skills suggesting that, all oh, this is just a figment. But there's pretty hard evidence, actually, pretty durable evidence from a lot of different inventories. But the inventory system, the, 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 the longitude and latitude, I don't think should remain the big five. At least we should test the big five more thoroughly. And that's what we're engaged in. So I will stop at that, and there's more on this in this book and in this particular paper, which you can download at once if you're remotely interested in this. This particular paper is pretty inclusive and has appendices, which will take you to it. So that's. But I did want to ask a question, which is a lot of these measures that you're looking at are about high school achievement. And a lot of the, uh, in some ways, the predictors or the soft skills are things like GPA or absences, and they're all truncated in the right tail. Right. That is to say, but presumably education for people at university, there's some value added that we're giving, we hope we're giving to people uh, long term. And so my question is, what do we know about uh, the contribution of education or the importance of these skills in the right tail? Well, see, that's, that's the second paper. So if you want to stay for another hour and a half. No, but actually, that's what we try to do, is actually look at the, so, I mean, th the short answer is that we look at education, and we look for different demographic groups. Uh, some, of these, some of these studies are done on targeted populations of very disadvantaged children. Uh, but here, we take national samples, and we ask questions, though, what's the benefit of an extra year of education at different levels of schooling? So we start, for example, you know, looking at graduating high school, and what is the effect uh, of second, you know, going to secondary, finishing secondary school, going on to, say, community college, from community college to four-year college, and so forth. So we can look at what the causal impacts are of education. That's pretty traditional. Uh, 
But we can also look at how it affects these cognitive and non-cognitive skills. And so what you find is there's a direct causal effect, but on the skills themselves. So you can actually see that. Now, you could argue. I think we could have a pretty good argument as to whether or not I, uh, you know, whether or not the effects are completely causal in the sense that I mean, I do think when the intervention, when I say completely causal, I mean exactly what the identifying strategy is. And we have multiple identifying strategies using instrumental variables, forms of conditional independence, matching, and so forth, uh, that more or less lead to the same uh, same answer. But if you, I think if you put the body of evidence together, you are finding that. Not only does education raise all of these outcomes, and we have a whole variety of measures, like out voting, uh, trust, physical health, uh, mental health, depression. Uh, we have a measure of smoking behavior and so forth. So from the same broad set of skills, maybe I should use the other slide. I have one graph that's actually really good. I don't know if you really want to see it. Uh, probably not. Okay. Uh, okay. But actually, you look at it, we have multiple outcomes. So using the same inventories, we see about 15 different outcomes that are both all related. And that gets back to the idea these capabilities are generating these basic behaviors. And they are modified by education, but at different levels of education and different levels. And, and this is the interesting thing, for example, if you want to look at what reduces crime, where does crime have its biggest impact and for which populations? So you get a relatively disadvantaged population, low in non-cognitive skills, you can see that Graduating high school is a tremendously important causal question. And promoting non-cognitive skills for uh, reducing crime. If you were to ask the same question for, say, reducing smoking, well, high school is there. But actually, uh, graduating college, or attending college anyway, plays a very important role. So it's, again, this notion that we have these multiple tasks out there in life. Education is another component here, obviously giving you the skill. But that coupled with the underlying traits. But it is boosting the traits. So there is evidence that above and beyond just the effect of being at a given grade of schooling, there is an additional effect of those traits. So the traits boost the schooling, and the schooling has an effect above and beyond the traits. So they're both together. And that's, that was the second paper. I mean, the, the, un, the un, uh, untold story, I guess. What do you think is the implication? So in the summary statement, <coughs> that soft skills were were more malleable at, at um, Ages. Seems to be, yes. And so, what, what do you think is the implication of that to you know the the, re the returns on investments, you know later ages versus earlier ages? Because you know you've you've sort of like, you know, made the point earlier that you know investments that you know when you're very young are more sort of like socially desirable than. Well, there is there, later. There, no, ages. I understand uh, the question. Uh, the the fact of the matter is, is if you look at this OECD summer, we do find some pretty effective investments. I mean, there is a life cycle dynamics here. I mean, if you just look at the, the dynamic model of skill formation, what you are going to find is that more, the better, the, the larger the skill base earlier on, the more the returns will be over the life cycle. I think that's pretty well established. But what is also the case is that there is kind of fatalism that's crept into certain notions, that it's all over by age three. I mean, there are these people, there are a lot of advocates out there, and it's very, you know, they have these buzzwords and so forth. I don't want to repeat them all here. But they're really suggesting it's all over at age one, at age three, maybe prenatally. People are still learning and acquiring skills throughout the lifetime. But it turns out that this malleability, I think, is really important, especially if you're designing second chance programs. That even if a kid's IQ really might not be boosted at age 14, 15, or 16, there still are effective programs that can, working through these soft skills, can actually remediate. See, the health is an interesting attribute, which I've really understudied and under, under, I haven't really talked about fully in terms of the dynamics of health. But there are a lot of uh, health uh, outcomes, right, that seem to be fairly, uh, fairly susceptible to treatment if individuals start, stop certain behavior, like smoking, right? I think smoking, if you actually stop smoking within about 10 years or so, right, I think you can restore yourself, not fully, but apparently the risks are, are very much smaller. So there is a malleability there in some sense, in terms of just physical health. I put health as a capability. So what I want to suggest is that you want to think of a broader notion of skills. But here's the question. If you have a particular target, say like education versus crime, then what would happen would be that if you were to imagine sort of where you might want to target that in the life cycle, and if you look at the different productivities of investments, 
or uh, interactions with children uh, or people over the life cycle, that different programs, uh, I mean, for different objectives, would target different stages of the life cycle and possibly with different kinds of, of, of intervention programs. So really, you know, thinking of aiming at tr I mean, trying to raise the IQ of high school dropouts is probably not a wise strategy. Changing their behavior, giving them advice. I mean, you know, there's this old joke by an uh, old quote from Woody Allen that 80% uh, of success is showing up. That's what these mentoring programs are teaching. And they're actually teaching it, and it has been effective. But it's partly through this kind of structured incentive. So it does suggest that certain mentoring programs can be effective. But uh, I slid over the, I mean, it went over the slide quickly. Job Corps is something which is very, very popular, politically very popular. Job Corps has no long-term effect on its participants, none. There are experimental evaluations showing that. Um, mostly, its effect is an incapacitation effect. You're putting kids, that's not successful. But one goal in some of these other programs, the Seattle program I talked about, precisely because it was working with mentoring and all with teenagers, giving them advice, staying with them, did boost their soft skill. They were actually able to associate more with others. And, and this gets back to a more broad notion of parenting or what we think of as education, is really involving this interaction between uh, the child or the, 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 the adolescent or whatever, or maybe even the young adult, and the, uh, the, the mentor or the teacher or the parent. I mean, I view this as all part of the same process, but age-adjusted and adjusted for the fact that certain things you can hope to achieve and other things you can't. But I think it's a mistake to write people off and say, well, you know, all 17-year-old dropouts are, are doomed. They're not. And there are a lot of effective programs which have been, and we, we try to, we document at least what we know from hard evidence on it. So I don't think it's all, but I do think you get very high returns on early investment, precisely because instead of remediating and kind of catching up, you're kind of building the base and it makes people more able to actually keep advantage of everything else that happens downstream. So for example, special education is costly. If you can reduce those behaviors that lead to what's called special education, then you can actually save money for the schools. And the kid, instead of being put in the detention room and, and being punished and so forth, can actually be out doing a science project or maybe exploring the world in a more positive way. So I do think there are lost opportunities. So that's the evidence about dynamics of life cycle that would favor early investment, but it's not all over. And there can be some very effective returns. But I think that's true in like in health interventions now too. The behavioral economists are really trying to change what I would call, what I've been calling here is something like character skills, the capacity to self-regulate. I know that uh, George Lowenstein and his group, I don't know how successful, I haven't looked at the long-term success of those studies, but they are basically motivating people towards self-control. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous is a very successful program, but it works through a very interesting social regulation system where basically the strong mentoring, right? You decide to go off the wagon, you call the phone, there are people around you, you really can't go off the wagon too quickly without being observed and being given counseling. And that's true of a lot of activities, and those are for adults. So that's why I don't want to suggest it's all early childhood. I know I'm associated with that, but it's, uh, it's not... Uh, it's not the whole story. Thank you. Um, appreciate your effort in bringing this uh, non-cognitive skills and character skills to the table. Um, so I guess uh, our thinking is shifting more from IQ based to more of uh, soft skills and non-cognitive skills. Um, so then what will be the uh, uh, policy implications um, of this research for school reforms or educational reforms at the national level? For instance, we're talking a lot about common core and curriculum development, how does that um, you know, affect uh, these national movements? Well, see, that's uh, in this GD book, we actually have a chapter on uh, discussing the history of testing. And what happened, I think, from really well-intended well people, the concept of education in the United States anyway, and I think the view in the United States influences that in the rest of the world, actually, it has traditionally has gone from this a much broader notion of what Horace Mann was talking about in 1838 and Tyler in 1940 to a very narrow notion about cognitive, cognitive achievement. And literally, the success of school reforms was given by how well people were doing on things like no child left behind tests. Those were so focused 
So it literally was the case that physical education, music, even physics were phased out. They weren't tested. So this is, you know, good economics. If you give people an incentive, they respond to it. <laughs> That's always true. But uh, what happened is some of the other dimensions were substantially screened out. So for example, uh, in, in Korea and in Japan, <clears throat> China, this massive emphasis on the achievement tests has led to these extracurricular activities. Like in, in Korea, it's called Hakwon, I think. And literally, kids are spending like five, six hours a day after school studying for these tests, all for these very narrow achievement tests. That limits creativity. I think it limits a lot of these other characteristics which we do highly value. So everything becomes, you know, you could argue, some people say, well, you know, also produces cheating by teachers and so forth. A lot of arguments against it. But what I really want to say is that I think that we are, have been so narrow. And I think all, it, it, it just became, because there's a, there's a certain dynamic to policy, right? The politicians, so Bill Clinton, for example, when he was governor of Arkansas, was very concerned about this report that was issued 30 years ago called A Nation at Risk. Schools weren't doing very well. The measure of whether the schools did well was basically achievement tests. So then, naturally, the dynamic led to the idea that what we need is to boost achievement tests. And that was a good measure of what performance of school would be. But then I think what happens is it kind of subverts the educational process. And we think about education more broadly, we'd want to measure it more broadly. But what's happened is we've been measuring it so narrowly. So many people, actually in East Asia in particular, have said, OK, great. Shanghai may lead the world in terms of PISA scores, but are they leading the world in terms of students who are creative, students who are actually going to uh, engage in some of the other activities? And this is discussions even among the Chinese themselves. So there really is a very broad, uh, a broad, uh, a broad view here that I think has been is, is encouraged by looking at these soft skills. But it also suggests that we can target and we think about programs very differently. So it's not just a question about my trying to force an extra year of education or teach them a new fact as much as teaching these people new strategies. So I think it changes the educational philosophy. And it changes the nature of the way we think about remediation. And I, it certainly, I think, will change the OECD assessments of various countries and various educational systems. That's the promise. Uh, because, I mean, it's common sense what I'm saying is that these non-cognitive social emotional skills are important. It's just that it was viewed you couldn't measure them. And I think we can. And there's very exciting work about how to do that. So I think it will change educational policy. And, and for the good. I mean, I've given this talk to people in East Asia. Um, there was a World Education Forum a few weeks ago in, uh, in uh, Seoul, Korea. And there was a lot of uh, interest. Because again, you know, the world experts, such as they were, were focusing mainly on these achievement tests. And then when you look at the broader inventories, people intuitively recognized they were important. What they didn't recognize is they could be implemented in a way that was successful. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.